hello everyone and and thanks for joining um just wanted to give a, a heads up that we do have closed captioning available and instructions are here on the screen and there will be some instructions in the chat as well to make that clear um, and easy um, and as we begin um, I'd like to share where I'm joining in from. And so I'm joining from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'm deeply grateful to have grown up as a first generation settler on these territories. And as we ground ourselves in what it means to be on unceded land, I also want us to ground ourselves in what it means to do public engagement on unceded territories. In addition to thinking about how the world of public engagement can uplift and amplify Indigenous voices, I invite us to reflect on how public engagement has historically and currently means engaging with colonial governments on their terms of engagement. Um, so let's seek to embed that reflection throughout the conversation today and to embed a power and equity lens, in particular as we have a conversation about who's typically been excluded from engagement processes and as we talk about how we can rebuild models of engagement. And at this point, to ask everyone to uh, to share in that reflection, I'll ask you to share um, which territories you're joining in from in the chat, if you can. Um, and uh, as a personal intro, my name is Veronica Belitsky, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of City Hive. And I'm just one person as part of a really huge team across three organizations putting on this series of dialogue-centered events in the virtual space. Our um, organizations, Public, SFU Public Square, the Center for Dialogue, and City Hive came together to create and host the Distant Not Disengaged series as an opportunity to explore what we're learning from this time and in the process to continue to convene folks through constructive dialogue. Today's session is titled Whose Voice? Reimagining Public Engagement. This event's topic is especially close to the work that City Hive does every day in engaging youth to be a part of decision making and civic processes and reimagining what public engagement can feel and look like. As we all know, this is a pretty extraordinary time, which has made challenges and opportunities more acute and which offers an opportunity to recreate and reimagine the status quo and the way that we do things. So today through the event, we'll be talking all about what we've been learning uh, through um, the pandemic um, and how that's uh, forced to change the way that we engage with one another and with our governments. Um, we'll be challenging ideas of what public engagement should look like and diving into how we might be able to reimagine the world of public engagement. Um, and all of this uh, will be happening through our stellar moderator and panelists. Um, who will be bringing unique perspectives to the world of engagement and through all of your participation having joined this event. Um, and before I hand it off to them, um, we wanted to get a sense of who is in the virtual room. Um, so you should see a poll popping up on your screen. Um, and we'll give you a moment to answer the question. And as, uh, as everyone is adding in their response, I'll ask Michaela to hop on and share what some of the results that we're seeing um, of who is on this call today. Hi folks, I'm Michaela and I'm also with the City Hive team um, located on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And right now, as it appears in front of me, I'm getting the sense that um, the majority of folks on the call are either new or emerging practitioners in the field of public engagement um, or they're experienced professionals in public engagement. So that's 36 and 28 percent respectively. And then it looks like um, about a fifth of folks are considering a career or building skills in this realm. And then uh, we have just a few less people who are interested community members, but you work or volunteer outside of the engagement sector. And there are other folks who are uh, explaining the other hats they wear in the chat, so we can monitor those shortly. But we're really grateful to have this uh, diversity and breadth of experiences and perspectives on the call. So thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Michaela. And yeah, just to add on to that, everybody who's here is meant to be here. So please bring in whatever experiences you're bringing in, whether you've been working in this field for decades or whether you're an interested community set, uh, member who's experienced engagement um, as, a, as a citizen or resident. Um, and so um, I'll quickly run through our community guidelines. And this is really important to make sure that 
the, um, the event that we're hosting is as safe as, as safe as it can be and everybody can show up as they are. Um, and so um, we're, we ask that you please provide your full name as your display name during um, this online session and that you review these community guidelines. Um, and so we'll be posting these in the chat as well, um, but I'll quickly run through these. Um, there's zero tolerance for those who promote violence against others on the base of race, ethnicity, national orig origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious affiliation, or different ability. And anyone who incites harm towards other participants will be removed at the discretion of our team. We ask that you be as present as you can, um, but of course, take care of any needs that you have. Um, thoughtful questions are welcome throughout the whole session, and we invite you to, to add any questions or comments or thoughts in the chat. Um, please don't assume pronouns, gender, or knowledge based on someone's name or their image. You can refer to the username that people are providing. Step up and step back. So that means that if you've asked a question or shared a comment al already, perhaps hold off on adding another question in and leave some space for other folks to participate. Um, and lastly, and really importantly, is to practice self-care. So the beauty of being able to hold these events from home is that you can stretch when you need to, refill your tea, grab some lunch, um, and make sure that you're doing everything that you can to, uh, to, make your, to allow yourself to participate as you need to. And so over the next hour, um, you'll be hearing shortly from our moderator and a welcome from our panelists. Um, and then we'll be jumping into breakout rooms where we'll have, we have a number of witnesses from different organizations um, and entities um, who have some sort of decision-making power um, and role in engagement processes. And they'll be listening as we have conversations in breakout rooms. Then we'll come back and hear from our panelists and have a discussion. Um, and then we will close off. Um, and an exciting uh, new element as part of today's event is that we actually have a prize draw. Um, and so we'll be randomly selecting three winners to receive an annual membership to IAP2 Canada. Um, and these participants uh, will be chosen from folks who self-identified as students during the registration and who are still here at the end of the event. Um, and if you don't know what IAP2 is, you'll be hearing a little bit more about that shortly from our wonderful um, moderator, Precious. Um, and so with that, I'll be handing it off to Precious Ile. And Precious is a student development educator at SFU and currently serves as a director on the boards of the SFU Alumni Association and IAP2 Canada. Um, and I'm also really grateful that Precious is serving on the board of City Hive as well. Um, so Precious, I'm thrilled to hand it over to you now. Thank you, Veronica. I'm pleased to moderate today's dialogue on whose voice reimagining public engagement. Um, as part of my professional affiliations, public engagement is very aligned with the work of SFU, City Hive, and IP2 Canada. And IP2 stands for the International Association for Public Participation. It's a member based organization that strives to promote and um, improve the practice of public participation across Canada and beyond. Um, it does that through several different ways, and that includes learning, networking, skills building opportunities. One of the things that folks may not know about IEP2 is, is that it's recently launched a Young Professionals Network, which I currently chair as well. And the goal there is really to bring young professionals, students, and emerging practitioners together to, to learn, to network, and to make meaningful connections, and to sort of build that community of, of public engagement practitioners. One of the things that's also cool as well is that there's a virtual community of practice that's going to be launching very soon. So I would ask you to stay tuned for that if you're interested. Um, I'd like to turn it over actually to our speakers because we have a number of folks who are joining us today. And I'm actually delighted because I've had a chance to speak with them before today's session. Um, Yute Leo, I think I'm going to start with Yute, um, is a video columnist at CBC and creator of the About Here video series, um, engaging audiences on lots of different topics um, about the city related from um, sky train to, to street food. Amanda Gibbs, also joining us as well from the city of Vancouver, is a facilitator, a community and, and organizational engagement and a communication strategist. And she's been with the city um, in the in engagement advisor role since 2016. 
And I'm also excited as well to introduce Davy Gobadun from First Nations Health Authority. Um, Davy, Davy is a citizen of the Sapotowewak Cree Nation in Manitoba. She's a director of engagement with FNHA and is working towards a vision of a healthy, self-determining and vibrant BC First Nations children, families and communities. Um, before we get into the breakout rooms, I'm going to get started with a warm-up question to our speakers. And that question is, um, what's your two-sentence definition of ideal public engagement? I will start with Davy and go to Yute and Amanda. Davy, please. Keeping us on our toes, precious. <laughs> um, ideal public engagement in two sentences. I think uh, for me, public engagement is really about creating a safe space where people uh, walk away feeling heard and ultimately empowered. Thank you. I love the piece around being heard and empowered. You take? Yeah, gosh, I uh, this is a <laughs> tricky question for me. I think public engagement can be used uh, terribly or very successfully towards so many different means. Uh, the, 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 like my thought is, like I think pu public engagement at its best is uh, is able to bring people to together to understand each other, build trust and sort of community relationships. Uh, I think it's a great tool for conflict resolution if we allow that to happen uh, and for uh, you know uh, uh, connections to 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 appear. Uh, I'm going to say like one last thing is like I think uh, public engagement at its worst really and what you know yeah what I'm like I really. You know, gets on my nerves is when we treat it as like a like the census you know like a statistically significant exercise it really isn't and when we treat it that way it tends to uphold and perpetuate really privileged opinions under the guise of you know we've heard from the public so there's my very wordy two sentence answer <laughs> thank you i appreciate you highlighting the double-edged sword of of public participation and how it can be used in different ways i think that's important to acknowledge um amanda Thanks, Precious. And so I would echo uh, some of what Ute said. I have a friend who dared me to do this. So I'm going to say the scene's dead. <laughs> and I'm going to say great civic and community engagement would be fueled by great civic education, uh, mm -hmm. informed. It would be fueled by radical transparency and courageous conversations. And it would be underpinned by a community development approach. I think you probably want me that when you talk about community development, because that's very much my background, but I really love the piece that you talked about, about being informed, about being part of a process and understanding what you're actually walking into. Um, those are amazing responses. I'm actually going to turn it back to Veronica or Mikkela from City Hive. So let's hear from the participants about um, what it's been like to be part of a process um, about public engagement or decision-making process. And perhaps people might actually dive into the, the double-edged swords of public engagement. Yeah, so great to briefly hear from our wonderful panel, and I can't wait to hear more. Um, and before we jump into a conversation from and with our panelists, we want to embody the spirit of reimagining public engagement and turn the dialogue over to everyone who's joined in today. So in a moment, you'll uh, receive an invitation to join a breakout room, and your breakout room will have a facilitator from our distant, not disengaged team, as well as a witness. Um, which is someone who holds some sort of decision-making capacity or power in their role in the realm of public engagement at their organization. Um, and uh, you'll be asked to respond to this question. When have you felt like your voice was heard by a decision-maker or in a decision-making process? And what elements contributed to that success? So thinking about what works in this realm of engagement. Um, and you'll have about 10 minutes in those breakout rooms. So it'll be a great chance to meet a few new people and to get started on some great conversation. Um, and so if you could uh, open up our breakout rooms, you should be getting an invite shortly. I guess back to our conversation, I was just harvesting some of the key ideas that came forward from the breakout rooms. And one of the interesting things that I was hearing from the notes that the facilitators had taken was the idea of trust the idea of making time because it takes time to build relationships. 
Um, I also heard the idea of respect and reciprocity, the, the idea that people can have mutual value when they're part of that engagement process. It's not just about taking from the public or taking from the community, it's also giving back as well. And I also heard people talk about empathy and storytelling, the power of storytelling, the power of listening to the diverse lived experiences of community members. And I really wanted to bring that piece, having heard all of these interesting nuggets, to one of the key questions that I think would be really interesting to kick us off. And that question is, who and what is missing from public engagement? And how is public engagement currently missing a mark? Um, Amanda, I'm going to get started with you. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, this may be my career ending move. So you may be witnessing this. We are so recording. here we are, yeah. <laughs> here we are. Um, I think that it's a broken, it's broken right now. And I think it's not just broken for government, it's broken for large institutions. And I think what's happened is the, the intention of engagement was always to bring voices in to help really address wicked problems that are not just technical problems, but like anything, like any kind of, you know, um, process, it has become hardened into certain ways of doing things that privilege folks who have the most access, time and resources. And so I think we have an opportunity now, it, like many industries or many areas, to, we have telescoped 10 years into the future, we were broken before the pandemic, and now we're really seeing the cracks in how we work. So what is the opportunity for us to start again and think about what makes what makes engagement work is when it's led by people from community that we get out of the way, that we actually privilege community knowledge and support it. You know, um, I did, I'd encourage all of you to look at Vu Lee's work in the US. Um, that education, Ute does this amazing civic education. We can't ask everyone to participate if they don't know how the rules of the game. So what are the rules of the game and how do we mainstream and make civic education and process sexy? And then we got to have tough conversations. We have to be able to tell people the truth when we can't, we can't do everything. As government, we, can't, we have to make tough decisions. And we often back into these conversations with what I call jazz hands engagement, with beautiful, creative, tactical things, but they don't get at the truth of what, what the tough trade-offs and decisions are for people. So that's my, I guess that's my pen drop, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Amanda, for that pen drop. I think what you've said is really interesting about um, being led by the community. I think this is a really important um, message that we need to talk about. And I think one of the things you also talked about is the idea of education. And given that you've just touched on some of the work that UTA does, maybe I'll just pass it on to UTA to talk a bit more about what's currently missing. Like, how is public engagement missing the mark? Yeah, let's totally bring it on. And I, I first have to say, like, I thought it was really cool to hear you, Amanda, you know, someone who works with the city, uh, the local government to recognize some of the, the failures of public engagement. And, you know, uh, that's really cool. Uh, the way I, I mean, I'm going to echo a lot of what Amanda said and, uh, you know, uh, but maybe frame it in, uh, in a way that I heard in my breakout room, uh, uh, someone mentioned, you know, uh, for a lot of people, public engagement is labor. It is work. It is time that they are taking off of their jobs, their lives, uh, and that is not an equal playing field. For, for a lot of people, public engagement, it, it's what they do on their downtime. I know a lot of people, <laughs> my landlord specifically, I'm not gonna say that too loud because he lives here with me, but uh, you know, like this is, you know, this is what they do on their downtime. I think for a lot of people, this this takes a lot of extra effort. And I think, um, you know, maybe sort of understanding who's missing from public engagement really kind of has to start from this uh, understanding of who is able to come easily to the table for these discussions and who have many barriers, whether it's uh, availability of time or, you know, just their, uh, personal understanding and education of these issues uh, and uh, and be very careful not to exploit that. Thank you. I think what you've sort of started to highlight is the idea of inequalities in resource, inequalities in time, um, who is able to participate and how perhaps the way that public engagement may be designed privileges those who have access to resources 
to engage in the process. Um, David, one of the things that I've heard you say perhaps in previous conversations is the idea of thinking about knowledge. Where does knowledge come from? Who, whose knowledge is privileged? And perhaps I wonder if you could speak to that or perhaps share more about um, who and what is missing from public engagement. I think people might expect me to, to talk about uh, this within the space of Indigenous rights, but I think what I actually want to talk about is um, compassion and, and how compassion's missing from our um, community spaces, our dialogue with one another. Um, that and patience. Um, and, and sometimes we're, we're sort of quick to um, judge somebody or quick to, um, you know, think of what we're going to be saying next in response to what somebody might raise in, in those sorts of spaces. But I think within the context of reconciliation, um, within the context of, of our journey with colonization, I think it really is about compassion and really being able to, as leaders, drill down to uh, almost like a value level of what connects us as human beings and finding those commonalities and building those bridges from that space. When I look at our neighbors to the south and the amount of anger and the amount of violence that's happening. And, and I really just think that as leaders, uh, we need to really think about compassion and how we, how we lead by, by, by um, um, how we boldly lead by being compassionate and having the courage to be compassionate. Did Precious go missing again? <laughs> no, I'm here. Oh, I'm there you are. And, and we're just okay. letting it stay. Yeah. Yeah, that was okay. Awesome. Okay, that's a moment I've been quiet for a while and just gazed into the camera. <laughs> humor. Let's Thank add you. humor to that too. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Um, yes. Humor. Being real. Like in our breakout group, people talked about having authentic moments with decision makers mm -hmm. where they dropped their guard, and they had like real interactions and not the kind of stage managed ones that were taught are important to have to hold space. So I, I think that's something that empathy and compassion is is powerful. And absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I am so surprised at how many public engagement uh, uh, projects are managed by PR firms, like for mm -hmm. real, it is mm -hmm. <laughs> astonishing. And I think, I'm you know, not. that is the wrong industry to be doing this type of work. Yuta, I love that you talked about perhaps the difference between PR, like public relations and public engagement. I think that's really one that's quite interesting to highlight as well, because I think sometimes it can get confused. Um, you know, and I think one of the things that perhaps I heard you talk about um, in some of our previous conversations is who, who's driving the conversation? You know, who's driving the agenda? What are we doing this for? Is it, is it for the organization or is it for the community? Yeah. And I think something that Davy kind of talked about as well is the idea of building bridges, um, you know, thinking about um, how we can have more compassionate leadership and courage. It really does take courage to, to build bridges. And I wondered if perhaps you could really talk about what it's like to build bridges and really center equity in the work that you do in public in engagement. I know that you do all do that in different ways. And perhaps you, I wonder if you wanted to kind of talk about that. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think I'm going to come off as a bit of a pessimist here, so I'm going to warn everybody a little bit. I, I mean, in my sort of personal experience and sort of reporting on, uh, you know, city policies that were very much informed by public engagement of sorts, but a very specific part of the public were engaged. Uh, I get the sense that like a lot of people lack compassion. A lot of people are, are very self-interested when they come to to public engagement and as a result of that a lot of the outcomes of public engagement tend to be rather oppressive I, I just wrapped up writing a video on the missing middle in vancouver and sort of understanding how our zoning bylaws uh they were really you know brought out of public engagement with single family residential homeowners and uh that set up this dynamic where we want all of the poverty and the issues with cities to be in one place and we want all of these single family residential areas to be the same and that was listening to that community but like you know, like, I mean, are we going to add, like, I don't know, it's, sorry, again, coming off as a bit of a pessimist, but I think sort of how we 
work our way out of that is I think there's sometimes a role for decision makers to be much more assertive about their compassion, let's say, uh, be the advocates for unheard voices in public engagement and understand that, you know, like I sort of alluded to earlier, that these public engagement processes aren't, you know, they can't be these sort of statistically significant processes. You kind of have to understand who's left out of the paper. Uh, out, out of the table and advocate on their behalf to some extent. Absolutely. I think you, you, you really got me fired up when you kind of talked about how we can really be first in our compassion. And I see that perhaps Amanda might have some things kind of chime in on, there, on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I feel that that's absolutely critical. And I think also working, you know, I've worked outside of government and within government. And I think one of the challenges is that you know, many of the people I work with are driven by passion and great values. And they're in many of the people I work with are trying to decolonize mm -hmm. um, institutional processes, but government is so slow, mo slow moving. <laughs> and so as I think that one of the things that's that and precious, we spoke about this is taking a systems based approach to analyzing where power sits and understanding where are the kind of levers, you know, as, as, as civil servants, we are, have a commitment public service values to our communities that we serve, but we also serve council. And so these kind of power dynamics are really powerful. And um, I have colleague Rina Sutar, who is a um, indigenous planner for the park board. And one of the things she's looking at is a toolkit of doing a colonial audit. Every time there's a decision made, can we ask some questions about what were the kind of power dynamics of those decisions. And so acknowledging that it's, some of these processes do feel terrible for the public. They often don't feel great as civil servants, but we are within a system. And how can we carefully start to at least surface that and talk about it? Um, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, that's kind of mealy mouth, but that's, you know, one of the things I think that can be helpful. Hi. <laughs> um, just thinking about, um, you know, the process of, of meeting people oh, where they're at and thinking about, you know, I think that that starts with listening and it starts with really understanding uh, a person's perspective. And I, I think part of it is also connected to, you know, my ability or our ability as an online community here today to do a bit of a root cause analysis and really find out what, what is at the heart of somebody's um, concern or at the heart of somebody's maybe uh, fear. Sometimes it's fear-based and, um, or, or, or hurt, um, hurt-based. And, and I appreciate the space we create for anger, but I think underneath is often hurt or fear. And, and really addressing it at that level, um, no matter who it is, um, uh, to find out exactly what is it they fear, what hurt them, and, and being able to watch from that space um, in a really genuine, genuine and authentic way. No matter who it is, um, prior to my work uh, with the FNHA, I worked with the Indian Residential School Survivor Society. We sat with um, over 100 uh, former students and their families through their uh, process with the government um, and witnessed um, um, their stories and their experiences and 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 it's it's interesting when you can just um, hold space as a safe first person what can come to the light you know sometimes um, sp silence speaks volumes and, and like I say we're, we're kind of quick to launch or quick to say something you know in response when somebody's speaking and I think Sometimes just being able to let a little bit of silence sit and then somebody's able to speak. So I think when we're, we're thinking of that within a space of privilege as well, if I have privilege in a space, then it's my responsibility or duty to sit and hold space for the person that uh, might not have as much privilege as me. Um, and, and to be able to be comfortable with, with being quiet. And quiet's not just like, quietness, uh, verbal quietness, it's in your body language. It's in the energy that you're, you're carrying into a space. So those are things I think about um, and, uh, 
in terms of engagement, in terms of working with people that might be carrying hurt or carrying fear um, in their mind or in their heart. I am processing your comment, Davy, around silence. I think that's really interesting. I think what perhaps what I think about when you speak of silence is perhaps challenging this idea that we always have to speak, so to say, or at least that speaking is maybe one form of, it's only one form of engagement and there's multiple different ways that community members can engage. And I think what that really says to me as well, um, when you talk about um, understanding the heart of someone's concern is this idea that I think we're almost in this age of polarization where we focus so much in positions that people are in, but we don't dig deep enough into perhaps the emotions, the concerns, the values that people are carrying. I think speaking to the heart that you're talking about. And you know, I wonder how we can we can center that a bit more in the work that we do, or perhaps what are the barriers to, to even centering heart in, in engagement in the work that we do? Um, perhaps um, maybe Amanda, you say, Davey, you could perhaps speak to this and how that shows up in your work. Because like these are conversations that I imagine practitioners have been having for a very long time. And I'm curious about what those organizational barriers might be. Can I offer, can I offer a funny one? Yes. <laughs> Feed people. Hey. Yes. Dude. Yes. Okay, we've been doing it since time memorial with feasting. Mm. And when you have to squeeze a provincial partner or federal <laughs> partner to bring, you know, some crusty donuts from <laughs> Tim Dad's Martin, cookies, you know, no. You know, it's just like feed people. And yeah. and and you know, when when I look at um, if we didn't have a budget and wherever I was working or whatever community I was working with, like we're bringing food from our house. I know it's a diff bit different with COVID. <laughs> Uh, now, but when it's safe again, uh, think about feeding people. Uh, and, and you think about, you know, I know it's a bit archaic to say it, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, like sometimes people are showing up and if you're doing any work with people in, in different areas, like they might not have had a meal for a while. Um, they might not have you know, drink water, they might have had a really busy day. So that's my uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, <laughs> contribution is I think we underestimate uh, the power of, of nourishment and food. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I really agree with just the idea that like some of the best public engagement I've been to are the ones where I've gone to meet people and I've gone to you know, make connections and not necessarily with, with people I agree with either just you know someone actually maybe I like I really disagree with but like you know I, I you know you just get to chatting and you know if there's food that really helps but you know even without it like if you're just a little bit more social if the process is maybe designed for some of those interactions to happen I think that would be a huge step in helping resolve some of the polarization that exists uh going into many of these uh uh you know, uh, sessions or, or, you know, public engagement sessions. Uh, I think like, you know, if we want to really nerd out about some of the process design, I think like a lot of public engagement is so like poorly designed for that. It's really like people just airing out all their concerns left, right and center. And, you know, and, you know, like city staff and decision makers are like, yes, okay. You know, mm, let's just get through this thing. They're looking at their clock. Like, I think, uh, there's so much, uh, you know, better, you know, uh, opportunities really for uh you know crosstalk uh or whatever i don't know i'm not really thinking of the right word for this but for people to really talk to each other and not like at each other i i completely agree with both of you and i think those are both th those are fundamental to the processes i've been part of that were powerful i think deliberate like for me the pillars are civic education and deliberative processes the chat and deliberative by that we mean bringing people into Congress where they're having the opportunity across difference, across, um, you know, and supported conversations. So we had, uh, I think Amanda Mitchell's in this group, I saw her there a number of years ago, we did a conversation around housing where we use the America Speaks model. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, it was Carol and Lukensmeyer who, um, we took a model where we brought people who had identified as having been homeless or poorly housed, 
people who are renters, people who are homeowners, together at tables talking about housing. And people expressed that that, that uh, conversation was one of the most powerful ones they've had about housing because they were really listening across difference and were coming to some understanding where um, you know, people who owned homes were listening to folks who had been renovated, who had massive challenges. So that is powerful, but what do we do during COVID? Mm. When we know that bringing people together for powerful conversations across difference where we have to support people where they are and people are struggling with basic survival right now, how do we do that? There's no, I don't think you can do that online. You can't, I don't know. Maybe there's some really creative thinkers in this group, but that's my worry. I, I share your worries, uh, Amanda. I really do. I think, you know, I think on the surface, maybe there's some initial excitement, right? Like online, like based engagement, I think tends to, well, we can expect newer or different types of participants maybe than we're normally used to, maybe a younger audience and whatnot. Uh, but ultimately, I think at its core, like what, what we want out of public participation isn't just like, you know, different types of people coming out, but like actually, you know, again, like we were talking about, like that relationship building, that connection building and uh, this, you know, as much as no, we all hate Zoom, right? Like, <laughs> I think uh, you know, like it, it really doesn't work great for that. Uh, I find so. Yeah. You know what? I'm loving Zoom. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. Very presumptuous. Because because often our our space and time with some of our real remote communities um, um, is is limited enough. They have uh, internet connection now. That's another issue, but. Um, if we're able to advocate for greater internet connection, which we've been doing as an organization and laying the, the actual groundwork to connect our communities, um, we found that Zoom is, 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 has created actually more opportunity for us to connect. Now, we're not seeing each other you know, twice a year as we normally do at, at our caucus sessions that we hold with our nation. But the ability to kind of see those smiling faces on the other side of Zoom, I think, is we're almost creating more different types of opportunities with some of our nations. I just encourage like everybody on the line to think about partnering with different community-based organizations. And I, I see we're doing that through this session, which I think is fantastic, because they often really know sort of what um, their, uh, their clients or their community members that are utilizing their services really need in terms of being supported in terms of engagement, um, whether it's food or whether it's a gift card to Safeway, or, or I guess there's not really Safeways anymore, but a gift card to the grocery store or something like that, that you could offer uh, for people in regards to uh, doing an online engagement, or even if there's like the technical space of having a laptop or a computer within a um, a community organization that community members are able to utilize um, to engage. And those are the types of things that we're looking at. Um, and and uh, also, you know, like Zoom, you can have it on your cell phone. So um, you can literally join a session on, on cell phones. So I think it's about getting creative, being persistent. Um, and honestly, uh, some gratitude for the, what technology can do for us. So, so I see that actually, and we've heard positive feedback from our nations on uh, utilizing Zoom. And it's kind of funny, you can do funny backgrounds and stuff like that too. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not a hater of Zoom. I, I mean, I can see why some people would be uh, because you don't want Zoom to take the place of uh, needed in-person services needed in-person conversations and those sorts of things. And I, you know, I can see why people would fear that some of our public institutions would take advantage of that fact. And I think it's a very valid fear. Um, so I'm with, I'm with you there, but I think that there is, um, there are some positives for community organizations trying to connect with community members. I think that's really fantastic that you bring this up. And I'm just looking through the chat and a lot of people are asking questions about creative ways to bring in food online. And I think Davy sort of talked about the idea of gift cards, mm -hmm. you know, and how we can address some of the concerns around food um, in, um, insecurity or food security. And I think it's also interesting. I think one of the things that I've started to see as well from the conversations that you started to be, you've, you've all kind of brought up is the idea of getting creative. Um, the idea of thinking about ways that we can work around things, because there's always different ways that we can um, approach things differently. 
Um, David, I was also really thankful that you talked about the idea of digital access and how we how that's really important and how that differs in different communities. Um, and I think that one of the things that I've started to think about, though, as I'm sort of building this whole idea of listening across difference and relationships is, I, I, I guess, perhaps going back behind the curtains of engagement. I think we're really talking about the, the front end of it. Going back in terms of leadership, um, who can we invite to, to lead engagement so that we can have um, representation from marginalized groups or underrepresented groups? Because I think there's oftentimes a lot of focus on the front side of it. Um, but let's talk about the, the leadership behind that. Um, who can we invite? How can we do leadership differently with public engagement? I, I think Devi's point is a very powerful one. Um, I think, you know, I'm, you know, very aware of the fact that as a city, we are really working to address, we have an equity framework that's being developed. We're looking at who's leading engagement, what the staff look like who are leading engagement. Um, and I think there's a, there's a lot that needs to happen at, a, at an organizational development level. Um, but I think there's also this model partnerships. Um, I think partnerships are powerful for government and City of Toronto has done a great job. I direct you to look at their public benefit strategy where they've outlined a way that the city can work with NGOs, compensate them and community organizations to lead a lot of the work that the cities have been trying to do kind of poorly. <laughs> so, you know, the city needs, cities need to transform their workforces to be representative and address um, basically the heart of whiteness at the, you know, municipal work. But there's also some short-term things that can happen around um, supporting community and advancing community models. That's not easy because bureaucracies are notoriously not agile and, you know, we're policy and rule bound, but there are models that are emerging now around trying to really um, say, yeah, let's look at, you know, governments do work with service providers. So if people have community relationships and deep connections. Let's, let's support and recognize that. Uh Oh, sorry, David. No, uh, think thumbs oh, up, thumbs yes. Up. Oh, me too, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take thumbs up. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, this conversation is kind of speaking to, like, um, it's reminding me of like the history of engagement and where this sort of term comes from, which is in like the 80s in England. <laughs> and, and, and sort of, it's, it's kind of like an acknowledgement and a progression of, you know, a rather uh, oppressive, form of governance, uh, you know, I mean, specifically in kind of the field that I report on urban planning, right, like, it was, uh, it was used by authoritarian governments. Uh, that's the, that's the history of that profession, you know, Hausman with, uh, you know, uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte with uh, totally like, you know, redesigning Paris, like, it's romantic now, but like that back then, that was a very oppressive move. So I think like, public engagement now is sort of an acknowledgement and a recognition of like, okay, we like, really centralized a lot of decision making and you know power in one place with that in mind you know like you know how do we decentralize that is kind of what i'm sort of sort of beginning to hear or understand from this conversation uh and the 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 ways you highlighted amanda i think those are great ways to bridge that sort of transition but i think ultimately we're looking towards you know communities really organizing and advocating for themselves uh maybe without a whole lot of extra assistance from sort of more a centralized decision-making body. It's a thought right now, I don't know. I, but <laughs> that's maybe where I'll leave it for now, yeah. I think for me, like just hearing what you're saying, um, it's, it, it is, it's all a massive trust building exercise. I think where the, our public institutions are um, running a massive deficit when it comes to public trust um, and it's really up to those institutions to do the work to build that trust back in a consistent, transparent uh, way. Um, I can't tell you the countless spaces I've been as, as an Indigenous person um, uh, where, I've, where it's placed upon me to speak for all Indigenous people, to speak for all 203 communities in BC and the thousands in Canada. Um, and, thousands more in North and South America. Let's not even get into the global situation. Mm. 
And so I think that, you know, again, when I think about reconciliation, about um, people being, you know, coming, coming uh, forwards, meeting people where they're at, but I think it's a responsibility of each participant in that space to get themselves up to a certain baseline in their knowledge level. Um, so uh, when, when I'm working with allies, uh, when I'm working with partners uh, in that space, I work in healthcare. So in the space of maybe healthcare, we could say in this context, you know, my expectation is that they're coming to the table with a certain baseline sort of knowledge about our history, about colonization, about their space within that. And, and, and I think part of, part of being a good partner is, is having, again, the understanding in terms of where they're at, they're at in their journey, in their healing journey. Because when you are thinking about decolonization, when you are thinking about um, how that's impacted you as someone that's non-Indigenous, you're on a healing journey too. You know, <laughs> we, we talk about Indigenous healing journeys, but I'm really interested on, on non-Indigenous healing journeys and what that looks like, you know, um, in that space of compassion, in that space of um, self-awareness, self-understanding, um, in that space of language utilized and, and sort of where people are at in that journey. So yeah, that's kind of what, I, what I'm thinking about in this conversation. Thank you. That was that was amazing, and I I it's interesting because I think this is one of those conversations you, we can go on and on and spend the whole day on it because it's just so deep and rich. Um, but what I do want to do is just be mindful of the time. I do want to perhaps synthesize some of the thoughts that you've shared today, and I think some of the things that I've been hearing from you around reimagining public engagement is really coming back to the simplicity of of being human, of of relationships, of trusts, of feeding people, of hospitality, of, of thinking about where power sits and how we can share power or decentralize power, um, of thinking about the idea of making connections in a very intentional, deliberate way, of listening across difference. And these are things I think we sort of already, we know, we think we, we talk about it all the time, but sometimes we forget to do that. Um, and I, I think that part of what I'm hearing from you is perhaps a hard shift. It's less just a technical uh, problem, so to speak. It's it's one that requires like hearts and minds. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for, for reminding us of those really critical elements of human relationships that really are at the heart of public engagement. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to um, City Hive, Veronica Mikila, to perhaps um, connect us with our graphic class facilitator, who's taking up some really interesting notes and synthesize the thoughts from today's dialogue. Thank you so much, Precious. Um, and to the three of you as well, Amanda, Yute, and Debbie, I won't add to your beautiful synthesis, Precious. I don't know how you're able to capture that whole conversation. Um, and yeah, I feel like this conversation could go on for so, so much longer. Um, and as we as we end, we'll ask everyone to stay on for just a few moments. We'll still aim to wrap up by 1.15. Um, throughout this whole hour, we've had a very talented graphic facilitator, Vivian, um, capturing the whole conversation in, uh, in illustration. So Vivian, we'll pass it on to you to share your screen and walk us through your creation. And you're muted, Vivian. Great. So this is the first question to prompt that um, this whole conversation started with is when is your voice heard by like a, a person in power? And the first thing I have is people listening and patience. And then having like youth groups together to make these decisions also can lead to these decisions being heard. And the storytelling I find was pretty impressive because um, yeah, you really need to know about someone's history to understand like what, um, what they don't have and what they have, what they have access to. And the fourth one is payment, not just experience as someone said, uh, like, some of the more experienced people just pay, uh, just pay an experience, which does not lead to validation. And the fifth one is validation. And then the sixth one is compassion, which I will go into more depth about. Okay, here are some of the failures of, well, 
failure of public engagement. And the first one is just as time consuming. People think it's time consuming. People just think that it's something you do um, during your spare time, which leads to not enough engagement. But what, how can we improve? First one is the compassion from privileged people. They have to listen and understand instead of like talking at people, they have to listen to people who are not in position um, to make better changes and um, provide meal, housing or food, like understand each other's um, position or situation makes um, public engagement better. And then we have digital access. Some may not have access, so we have to take into account of that and trust you trust your community if not then um, public engagement is not going to work and um, someone touched on the decentralization of power but then i don't really have enough time to like draw that out but yeah that's all i have right now <laughs> right Awesome. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, and everyone will be receiving all of Vivian's creations by email, as well as any resources or links that were mentioned or dropped in the chat. So if there's anything that um, maybe you didn't get the chance to drop in the chat, feel free to do it now and we'll, we'll send that all out afterwards. Um, and uh, we have two more things to run through before we finish off. Um, and before I pass it off to Michaela to, to announce the winners of our draw, um, I'll invite everyone um, to take a moment and to share a takeaway or a learning from today's session in the chat. Um, and so you can you can take a moment to do that. Um, and in the meantime, Michaela will be running us through the winners of the draw. Okay, folks, I don't know how I always get to do this most fun job, which is to use a random name picker <laughs> as I enter folks while the session is happening. Um, and again, thanks to Precious. This was Precious's idea to support three student memberships to IAP2. And I think it's such an excellent initiative. Um, I'm going to paste the names in the chat of our three winners, but I will also say them out loud. So the first winner um, is Han Pham. The second winner is Andrew Figueredo. I, I'm really sorry, folks, for uh, messing up your names. And the third is Veronique Jones. So I put those in the chat. I have your email addresses that you registered with to the three of you. Um, if you would like me to follow up with you using a different email address, um, please feel free to private message me in the Zoom chat right now. And I'll connect with you after the event so that we can get you set up with your membership. And thanks again to you three for being here and for all the other students who registered and attended. Awesome, thanks Michaela and congrats to the winners and thanks as well Precious for that great idea. Um, so before we, we hop off, we wanted to share a few upcoming events. So um, on the 21st, which is somehow already next week, um, IAP2 Canada is going to be hosting an event um, and you can find all the details via Eventbrite. Um, and as well, you can stay tuned to our next um, Distant Not Disengaged event on November 19th, the gendered impacts of COVID-19. Um, so you can join us back then and you can uh, get the details to register um, via our, our organization's channels uh, via City Hive, uh, the Center for Dialogue or SFU Public Square. Um, and before we close off, thanks to everyone who's sharing their reflections and learnings and takeaways in the chat. Um, and just another huge, huge blast of gratitude to Precious for your incredible, talented moderation and thoughtful questions. Um, to our panelists, Davy, Yute, Amanda, thank you for all of your thoughtful reflections and for all the work that you do. Um, and to the whole Distant Not Disengaged team um, and the many people behind the scenes making this possible. Um, and to all of you who have attended and, um, and participated through the, the breakup rooms and the chat, thanks so much for showing up. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Distant Not Disengaged event.